Hey guys, uh, just wanted to let you know, Shelly and I are alive and well and we're doing fine and we are praying for a, a negative test uh, tomorrow. We would appreciate your prayers for that and uh, we will hopefully be able to join you Sunday. Uh, I thought we would do a little praise uh, before this evening's service. So let's sing, Blessed Be the Name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of our God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that calms my fear, blessed be the name of the Lord. His music in the sinner's ear, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You would think that with COVID-19, we would all be praying more. I'm not so sure that's the case. Oh, I think when all of this started back in March, uh, we all did pray and prayed a lot. But unfortunately, uh, through the weeks and the months, uh, we may have come to understand that this virus is gonna last a lot longer than we want it to last. And sometimes what that does is uh, it removes the need to pray as urgently as perhaps we once did. How about you? Are you praying more or less than you used to back in March? What do you suppose that is? Well, let me just share a couple of possibilities. One thing, we may not be praying as much because of calm seas. Calm seas, okay? And I think that that's just human, na human nature, rather. I think that's just human nature. Because when we're in crisis mode, we become praying machines. Uh, when things like uh, sickness hit us or someone we love, uh, then we pray. When things like uh, financial disaster, job loss, kids in trouble, coronavirus, we pray and we pray and we pray. It seems like we can't pray enough. But then you know what happens? The crisis passes and so does some of the motivation uh, for praying as much as we used to. Oh, I know coronavirus hasn't passed, but maybe we've kind of come to realize that uh, it's gonna be around here for a while. And uh, maybe we've come to the conclusion that, uh, well, God will just get rid of it when he gets rid of it. And we may not be praying as often or perhaps as passionately as we once did. Well, I said that's human nature, you know, uh, we follow uh, rhythms and cycles and uh, that's just a part of life, being a human being. But is there anything we can do about that? Anything we can do to disrupt these cycles? I think there are a couple of things that I would suggest. One 
is to realize what the nature of prayer is to begin with. Sometimes we look at prayer like a spare tire in our trunk. It's something we only pull out or think about or use when there is an emergency. That's true, and you know that that's true. But uh, prayer is not just a spare tire. It's a relationship. It is a relationship with the God of this universe. I want to share a little uh, excerpt from uh, uh, one of my spiritual hero's books. His name is Henry Blackaby, and the book is Experiencing God. On page 174, let me share with you what he says about prayer. Quote, prayer is a relationship, not just a religious activity. Prayer is designed more to adjust you to God than to adjust God to you. God doesn't need your prayers. He's omniscient. God doesn't need your prayers, but he wants you to pray. You need to pray because of what God wants us to do in and through our lives during the time that we're praying. God speaks to us by his Holy Spirit through prayer. I want to say that again. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit by prayer. And therefore, we need to understand that our prayer doesn't lead to an encounter with God. It is an encounter with God. Prayer is a relationship. It's not just a religious activity. If that's true, and I believe that it is, then perhaps one of the things that we can do is recommit ourselves back to the process of prayer. I'm thinking of the routine that Jesus talks about in Matthew 6 concerning prayer. Right there in the middle of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about two or three things that we need to do in order to pray on a regular basis. Let's see what those are. By the way, I liken these three things to exercise. Do you exercise? Did you used to exercise? Should you exercise? <laughs> Need I go on? All right. Well, if you were exercising, there are two or three things that you would need to do. Number one, you would need a time, okay? Now, often people do it early in the morning. Sometimes people do it late at night. Doesn't really matter the time, but you need a time. If you don't set a time for exercise, chances are you're not going to do it, at least on a consistent basis, all right? Same thing is true of prayer. Listen to what Jesus says about prayer in Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the synagogue, so on and so forth. That's not what I want to focus on. I'll focus on that first phrase, when you pray. Now, Jesus didn't tell us when to pray. He didn't say, when you pray first thing in the morning. He didn't say, when you pray the last thing at night. The time of day is not nearly as important as setting a time to pray. Again, going back to this exercise routine, you need to set a time so that you will develop some consistency. The same thing is true about prayer. When do you pray? Well, again, we might get back to that uh, uh, emergency mode, right? But if you were to pray on a consistent basis, when would it be? Would it be early in the morning? Would it be late at night? Would it be at noon? Would it be, you know, coffee break? Whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter when. What matters is that you set a routine. And that routine itself helps us to be consistent in our prayer life. So number one, we need a regular time. Number two, we need a regular place. In uh, Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father. Well, now, I don't think he is saying that we, we, have, we, we need to get in our closet and shut the door and whisper so nobody hears us. That's not the point. The point is not necessarily where as much as it is to have a place, all right? Have a quiet place. Have a secluded place. And I don't know where that is. You may get up earlier than everybody else in the house, and you could just pick any room that you wanted to. Or you might have a patio that you like to, to go to and, uh, and to sit and reflect and to pray. It doesn't matter where. Again, like exercise, you need to know where you're going to exercise. For many, many years, for me, it was a gym. 
I think I'd mentioned before, I joined the YMCA when I was in high school, and I never uh, went a time without a membership in some sort of a health club until last March when uh, this uh, virus hit. And I realized that for someone my age, it was perhaps uh, uh, hazardous to, to go into a gym. What, what did I do? Just quit exercising? No, nope. I went online and I bought a stationary bike, nice one, computer, all of that kind of stuff. And I now exercise in my garage. Now, I thought it looked really nice in our extra bedroom, but my wife says it looks great in the garage. <laughs> so that's where I exercise. But the point is not where, it's that you have a place. Again, that helps support consistency. So you need a time, you need a place, and then you need a pattern. That's what Jesus says in verse 7. He said, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. Okay, babbling. You ever done that in your prayer life? I have a confession to make. <clears throat> I pray in the mornings when I wake up before I ever get out of bed. But I also pray at night, right after I get into bed. And what happens after I begin praying for a while? I fall asleep. <laughs> I fall asleep, okay? Maybe, maybe I need to fall asleep. Maybe that's uh, God's gift to me. But you know, if you're not careful... Uh, you're, you're, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're not serious about praying. Now, if I didn't pray in the mornings, I'd be concerned about the fact that every time I pray at night, I usually, go, I usually fall asleep. But find a routine that you can follow in your prayer life, regardless of where it is or when it is. Uh, that routine simply means you know what you're going to say and you know the outline that you're going to follow. You know, if you don't have a particular routine or an outline or a pattern, you know, you're going to be praying over here and then you're going to be praying over there and then you're going to, and you're going to forget somebody and you're going to leave somebody out and so forth. When I was in high school, I ran across uh, this acrostic that has helped me ever since to pray. And that is the acrostic for the word ACTS, A-C-T-S. Now, that's one of the books of the Bible. It's easy to remember, right? ACTS, A stands for adoration. Okay? Don't start your prayers by immediately asking God for things, okay? Uh, do you like it when your kids come in and, and you know, immediately start asking for things? You know? it, 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 it's appropriate to kind of set the stage a little bit, quiet our spirits, get in communion with the Lord. One of the best ways to do that is to start with adoration. A C, confession, okay? Confession. T stands for thanksgiving. And then the S stands for supplication. And that's when you would pray for other people and when you would pray for yourself. Acts is a good acrostic. Pray, the word pray is a good acrostic too. Uh, P would stand for praise. R would stand for, what do you think? Repent. A would stand for what? Ask, ask for other people. Y would stand for yourself. Ask for yourself, pray for yourself. Now, you don't have to follow these, you know, religiously or literally or never get off the, this particular path, but it's helpful to have some sort of a pattern to follow. So if you sometimes do not pray because of calm seas, just remember, number one, what it is, it's a relationship with God. And number two, how to keep that relationship going. And Matthew 6 tells us you need a regular time, a regular place, and a regular pattern that will help keep our prayer life going. So one reason we don't pray, perhaps as much as we should, is because of calm seas. A second reason, getting a little more personal here, because of sin, because of sin in our lives. This was the case with King David. Listen to what King David said in Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. He's talking about prayer. What does he mean, if I cherish sin in my heart? Someone put it like this. Either your prayers will keep you from sin, or your sins will keep you from prayer. Now, how does sin keep us from prayer? Two or three ways. Number one, guilt. 
we feel guilty. Number two, shame. We're ashamed of ourselves. And uh, having to do with both of those is the feeling of unworthiness. And perhaps we don't approach the Lord in prayer because we just don't feel worthy. Well, hey, let me tell you something. None of us are worthy. None of us are worthy. So don't let that stop you, okay? But that's not what David said. David said, if I had cherished sin in my heart. What does that mean? Some people don't pray. I believe this is true. Some people don't pray because they don't want to give up a particular sin. They're cherishing a sin. They're holding on to a sin. They're not willing to relinquish a sin. And David says, if you cherish a sin in your heart, God will not listen to you. All right. Sin can be one of the things that keeps us away from prayer. Well, what should we do? You know, right? Obvious conclusion, confession. That's the only answer, confession. In uh, Psalms, uh, well, I'll read that one in just a minute. In 1 John 1, 9, one of my favorites, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness or unrighteousness. But, but the real question is at the beginning. If we confess, if you continue to cherish your sin, if you continue to practice your sin, if you continue to allow your sin to keep you away from prayer, then you're never going to have a, a, a consistent prayer life. You've got to be willing to confess. Now, did David do this? Yes, he did. I was going to read this psalm just a moment ago. Psalm 66. I'm going to go back and read verse 18 and then the, the verses that follow. David, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. David did confess his sins. Perhaps one of the reasons you and I don't pray like we used to is because of sin. Follow David's example and confess that sin. Stop cherishing it. Stop holding on to it. Stop being embarrassed or ashamed about it or feeling unworthy because of it. Confess it and then pray before the Lord. That's what David did. So sometimes we don't pray because of calm seas. There's not an emergency. Sometimes we don't pray because of sin and something has come between us and the Lord. Let me mention a third reason I think that perhaps we've stopped praying the way that we used to pray. Disillusionment. <clears throat> disillusionment with God or disillusionment with prayer or both or both. It goes something like this. It could be that uh, we've given up on prayer because somehow we've convinced ourselves that God has given up on us. Or we've given up on prayer because we prayed something very urgently and passionately, but, but it didn't happen. And so we've convinced ourselves, well, that's a waste of time. Prayer doesn't work. Right? <clears throat> I hope you've never done that, but I've got a feeling that you have because I know that there have been times when I've done the same thing. What do you do? What do you do to cure yourself of this disillusionment with God or disillusionment with prayer altogether? Well, one thing we need to do is to listen to what Jesus said about prayer. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus makes this challenge. Jesus told his disciples about prayer to show them that they should always pray and not give up. We should always pray and not give up. Pray when the seas are turbulent. Pray when the seas are calm. Pray when there is something between us and God and there's something that's called sin and confess that sin before the Lord and then pray. And pray even if we think prayer doesn't work. Because let me tell you something. It does. And God listens whether you're aware of his listening or not. You remember this verse I just read? Jesus 
told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. What is this parable? Well, let me go ahead and read it. It's in the following verses in Luke 18. Jesus said, In a certain town that there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time this judge refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now the application. And Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. What is Jesus' point? Is Jesus saying God is like this unjust judge who doesn't care about what anybody says or is not afraid of anybody? No. This is not a parable by comparison. It's a parable uh, that says just the reverse. God is not anything like this unjust judge. And how more quickly will he respond to our prayers as long as we don't give up? Wait a minute. I thought we mentioned that sometimes we pray and God doesn't give us what we ask for. That's true. It doesn't mean he's not listening. Doesn't mean he doesn't care. It could mean any number of things. It could mean that we're making the wrong request. It could mean that we're asking at the wrong time, that the timing is wrong. It could mean that God has a different plan in mind. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care. It doesn't mean that he doesn't answer prayer. And so we should not become disillusioned by prayer. We should not become disillusioned at God. We should continue to pray just as Jesus said to his disciples. He wanted them to continue to pray and not give up. And he wants us to continue to pray and not give up. Ask this question in closing. Are you praying more these days or less? If you're praying less, I want to say something kind of harsh, but this comes from God's Word. Did you know that for a child of God, it's a sin not to pray? It's a sin. Listen to 1 Samuel 12, 23. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray. God considers it a sin. What should we do with the sin? We've already heard. Claim 1 John 1, 9 and confess that sin. And then follow that routine. It makes prayer easier if you have a regular place, a regular time, and a regular pattern that you follow. Whether you use the Acts acrostic or whether you use the Pray acrostic. Now, I want to quote an American theologian by the name of Larry the Cable Guy. Get her done. Get her done. Stop making an excuse. Stop being disillusioned. Continue to pray. And let's do that right now. Father, forgive us if we have considered prayer only something that we do in case of an emergency. And forgive us if we have allowed sin to come between us and our personal prayer relationship with you. And forgive us, Lord, if we become disillusioned, if we become even angry because at one point you didn't give us what we asked for. Lord, like a child, we don't need everything that we ask for, even if we want it. God, forgive us. Help us to develop uh, a, a consistent time of prayer because we live in a time when we so desperately need to pray. We ask these things in your son's name. 
Amen. Hey, let me mention that um, I'm in an empty auditorium again uh, this week, but this coming Sunday, August the 9th, this coming Sunday, we're going to have in-person worship again. Now, we will continue to live stream on Facebook and YouTube just like we have been Wednesday nights at 6 and Sunday mornings at 11. But we're going to have Sunday school at 9.30 and we're going to have a regular worship service at 11 this coming Sunday. Uh, it's been, uh, it will have been two weeks since we've had uh, a coronavirus incident. Uh, the building has been thoroughly clean and uh, we're anticipating that we will be able to open under safe conditions. So I hope that you will come and join us. Hey, I took the, the virus test last week and uh, I didn't do it because I was feeling any symptoms. I didn't do it because I necessarily came in direct contact with somebody who later tested positive. I simply did it as an example and uh, maybe to set anybody's uh, mind at ease uh, about their pastor. And the, the test obviously came back negative. So uh, we want to see you again. Uh, we hope that you will uh, come and join us this coming uh, Sunday morning. Now remember, as always, a lot of information on our website, fbcnoble.org, fbcnoble.org. Uh, there's uh, uh, prayer requests there, there are announcements there, uh, there are response cards there, there are places that you can uh, share prayer requests with us, just a lot of information, how you can give, um, how you can give online. Uh, you folks are doing uh, so well uh, with your support of, of the Lord's work and with your church. We appreciate that so very, very much. We do not, uh, we do not uh, consider that a given. Uh, we thank the Lord for your generosity. And uh, I just want to say, have a wonderful rest of the night, rest of the week. Hope to see you Sunday morning, 930 Sunday School, 11 o'clock for worship. If not, we're going to gather again right here together. Uh, online. God bless you and good night.